let me know when you're up. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rob Smith, the first selectman, and I'll be introducing everyone else as we go along here. Uh, but to my right is Bill Garish, the chairman of the East Island Village Revitalization Committee. Committee, and we'll be uh, he'll be taking over after my intro. So uh, again, welcome. I'm sure this is one of the most anticipated town meetings ever conducted in the town of East Haddam. Uh, and before we begin tonight's presentation, I'm reminding all of you that masks are required to be worn while in the school, except while talking into this mic. Um, so what will the citizens be voting on? This is a big question that is frequently asked. Based on the vision being presented by Center Bridge Group for the proposed Swing Bridge Landing tonight, the citizens of East Adam will be voting at a referendum simply to empower the Board of Selectmen to negotiate a definitive agreement with CBG, Center Bridge Group, allowing for the transfer and redevelopment of the town's property at 1 and 7 Main Street. CBG has agreed that the purchase of the property will not be executed, in other words, finalized, until a building permit has been obtained, thus allowing the town to obtain its ownership of the property until it is assured of a financially viable project that meets all its regulatory requirements. CBG believes everyone understands that to be successful, the agreement must reflect financial market realities. That being said, CBG's plan for Swing Bridge Landing illustrates their vision to meet the goal of enhancing the vibrant economic and cultural activity in the East Haddam Village District. It is important to note that the plans are presented, that the plans as presented are not set in stone and East Haddam citizens are not being asked to vote on the plans per se. The plans will undergo a vigorous and public process of regulatory agency reviews, revisions, and approvals. To emphasize this point, all plans for development within the village district must go through the Planning and Zoning Commission's special exception review process. They must also be reviewed and approved by the Department of Transportation. Additionally, the plans for mitigating hazardous materials found on site must be approved by DEP, Environmental Protection. The community water system must be approved by the Department of Health. Both the building plans and the site plan must also be approved by the East Adam Building Department, the Fire Marshal, Historic District Commission, and the Gateway Commission. And I may have forgotten one or two. Uh, before I turn the meeting over to Mr. Bill Garris, the Chairman of the East Adam Village Revitalization Committee, I need to make some observations and requests. First, there will be a second hearing as we have a substantial list of folks who wish to attend tonight's meeting in person, but due to the constraints caused and created by COVID-19, attendance was limited to 100 people in the auditorium. The next hearing will be the second week of June, uh, tentatively scheduled for June 9th. That's tentatively scheduled. We have to confirm that this room is available. People on the waiting list will be given priority. For tonight's question and answer period, which will occur after Center Bridge's presentation, I'm asking you to initially limit to one question or comment at a time. There will also be a three minute time limit for your questions or comments. If you have additional questions or comments, you will have an opportunity after all others have stated their comment or asked their question. Questions that are received electronically will be interspersed with questions from those in attendance. And finally, we plan on putting a hard stop on the meeting at 9.30, uh, unless we have a huge line of people waiting to speak at that time. So uh, please be considerate and keep this in mind when making comments or asking questions. So if your question has been asked and answered or you need further clarification, that's fine, but uh, please do not repeat you know, similar questions. Thank you for your cooperation, and I'll ask, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bill Garish. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming out uh, tonight. Um, before we get into really the heart of the presentation um, and, and the public hearing, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about 
uh, the East Town Village Revitalization Committee, um, and just some of the key milestones that have helped get us uh, to where we are tonight. Um, the committee, which is comprised of uh, volunteer East Town residents, um, solicited proposals to redevelop the town-owned property in the village. Uh, that was part of our, that was really our charge. Uh, the committee recommended Centerbridge Group to be the developer of this property uh, and uh, based on their qualifications uh, and their development proposal. I'd like to just take a moment to, uh, uh, to name or to, to share with you the, member, the current members of the committee. There have been some different iterations over the past several years. Um, in addition to myself as chair, chairman, uh, Melanie Kolick, uh, is a member and also serves as the secretary. Uh, Will Brady, Bob Kasner, Jim Curtin, Randy Dill, J.T. Smith, and Mark Walter, who has served as an alternate. And, uh, and all those folks have just spent a tremendous amount of time and uh, effort into to helping us get to where we are today. Um, tonight's public hearing represents a significant milestone in a long quest to revitalize the village of East Haddam. Um, having served on the committee for over 10 years, uh, as have several of my colleagues, um, I can say that at times it was somewhat doubtful that we'd ever get to this point, um, but, but here we are. Uh, and so I think it's, uh, it's exciting to, to have this proposal before us for the town's consideration, um, and it's uh, an important step forward to the re revitalization uh, for which I think uh, most of us consider to be the crown jewel of our town. Um, so the, the Village Committee was uh, initially established in 2009 by the Board of Selectmen for the purpose and oversight uh, and implementation of converting the town office site property into a commercially viable area. Um, committee re reviewed reports and resources that had been previously developed, um, such as East Haddam Mobility and Improvement Project, the East Haddam Village Ad Hoc Committee Report, and the Town Office Site Reuse Study uh, which we served as guiding documents. Um, we worked on a vision consensus statement at the time, um, and it's very, a lot of the elements, or I would say vir virtually all the elements that are in the proposal that you'll hear tonight uh, were in there, such as uh, a developing a, a walking village with mixed commercial and residential use. That committee issued a request for qualifications in 2010 there were no bids uh, received in response to that uh, RFQ. And the, con the committee continued to meet until I think about 2013 and then it just kind of petered out. Um, the committee reconvened in May of 2017. And this this uh, reboot of the committee corresponded with the pending opening of the town hall uh, and the vacancy of the former town hall property. So. Um, we started meeting again. We held a public forum in September of 2018, uh, which was well attended with over 70 residents and it provided valuable feedback to the committee about the best use of that site. And we used that information to help develop uh, the RFQ and then the RFP that we subsequently issued. Um, we also engaged the support of Connecticut Main Street, which is a, a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating and managing vibrant commercial districts. Um, they, one of the things that they assisted us with was uh, publicizing the RFQ and RFP to a, a wide network of developers, architects, uh, builders, and others. Um, so we really tried hard to get, get the word out about what we were trying to do. Um, we issued the uh, request for qualifications in, in March of 2019. We also followed up with a site visit to which we had five potential developers. Um, ultimately, we had one proposal, which was uh, the proposal that you'll, you'll hear tonight, um, which was, uh, that was to our RFQ, and, and then correspondingly, that was the only proposal to our request for proposals. Um, the committee spent a lot of time reviewing this proposal um, over the course of several weeks, many meetings, and we unanimously re re recommended the Centerbridge Group as a developer based on the criteria that was described uh, in the RFP. Um, we evaluated their proposal against four criteria uh, that were indicated in the RFP, which included uh, the project's financials, market feasibility, and other considerations. Um, we had a unanimous motion to recommend Centerbridge Group as the developer for the town-owned property. 
um, and that the town enter into, negotiates, into negotiations with Center Bridge Group to proceed with the development of the village property uh, and to schedule the necessary meetings and hearings to secure citizens approval. That's a very kind of an abbreviated summary of uh, how we got here tonight. Um, so uh, I'd like to next move on uh, to, um, like I said, the heart of the presentation. And um, before I introduce Mr. Riley, I would like, like to recognize Mr. D, uh, Bill D, De Cristoforo, I always have trouble with your name, I apologize, uh, who is the chairman of the Board of Finance. Uh, and Bill, I don't know if there's anyone you wanted to recognize on your, your uh, committee. Yes, Bill, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to recognize the other members of the Board of Finance, Harvey Thomas, longstanding member, Todd Gelston, and Tracy Gianta. If she's not here now, she'll be here shortly. She just texted me. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I, before we get started, I also want to just mention to reiterate what Rob was saying is that um, we'll have our presentation, we'll take a short break, uh, and then we have built in what we hope is ample time for questions and answers, um, and um, would like to finish up by 9.30. Uh, there's also an FAQ that, uh, if you didn't get it on your way in, please, uh, please get that. Um, and I think that's it. So I'd like to now turn it over to Jeff Riley who, with the Center Bridge Group. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, well, good evening. I, uh, my mic is working. Um, so I'm here with my wonderful wife, Mary. Um, Mary and I, we actually started this project five, six years ago. Amazingly enough, we've been at this for six years. Um, and three first selectmen. Um, Mary and I moved here uh, 11 years ago. We built a house on uh, Sister Number 5, um, lovely view of the river, um, and have fallen in love with this town. Um, I should mention that um, I actually have come to this town for my whole life. Um, my godfather was Al Sullen, who, who helped um, restore the Good Speed Opera House and who produced uh, Man of La Mancha at the Opera House. So I've been coming here for um, every summer for uh, years and years and years. That was 1963, I was 18 at the time. Um, Mary and I are both uh, architects um, and uh, we are um, committed to this project um, in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, we understand that there are people who um, are not in favor of it already, and people who are very much in favor of it. Um, our only hope is that we can change a few minds tonight, and at the very least, um, convince all of you that our hearts are in the right place. Um, I'm going to introduce our team. Just, I'm going to do quick introductions. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, Mike Goman isn't here, um, but we do have, um, Mike Goman is our financial guy from Goman in York, um, and he's unfortunately in the hospital, um, but his, he, I, I know pretty much everything that he knows. Um, uh, Sam Haydock is our, uh, from BL Companies, is uh, in charge of our hazmat and our water system and all of those civil engineering items. Um, John. Uh, Pollard and his lovely wife, uh, Karen Pollard, are our market, real estate market um, researchers and, and have um, done a lot of the market studies. Um, I founded um, Centerbrook Architects in 1975, and uh, just as a little bit of a hint of what we do, if some of you may know, um, we do a lot of urban design, a lot of urban development projects. Um, but closer to home, um, we've worked on, we did the steamboat dock down in Essex, uh, the Ocean House um, Hotel in, in, uh, in Rhode Island, some of you may know that, um, the Eugene O'Neill after housing in New London, uh, the <clears throat> Bedford Square um, mixed-use development down in, in Westport. So this is, we're, this is our home, this is 
the kind of stuff we love to do and have been doing for almost 40 years. Um, the, uh, I, I already went through the team, so I'm going to just um, jump in and say that the project is um, $51 million, sounds like a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, in our business, it, it's not a terribly big project, but um, it's still a lot of money. Um, it's 94,000 square feet of privately funded uh, mixed-use development on 3.72 acres. The property that we're buying from the town is 2.75 acres, but I'll explain how we get up to 3.72. Um, it will have shops and restaurants. Uh, it will have apartments and um, what are known as short-term rental apartments. Um, you may probably better know them as b and um, Airbnb. So we're trying to get kind of a hotel component uh, along with the condos. All of that is yet to be really figured out, but um, having a, a, a hotel idea, a hotel component is extremely important, we think, to the, to the village. Um, the project will uh, we believe, um, estimating, uh, increased the grand list by over $25 million. That's a lot of grand list. Um, and, and added to that would be the increase in property values within the whole town. Um, that's a significant uh, increase. Um, it will generate over about $10 million in annual sales volume. Uh, these are all estimates by Mike Goman and Goman and York. Um, and we'll create about uh, 90 permanent jobs uh, within the town. Um, our goals, They're, these are really important because this is what really you're, you're voting on <laughs> is, is the goals of our project um, and that Mary and I will shepherd uh, through the very lengthy and, and convoluted uh, process of getting everything approved. Um, first of all, we want to make it a destination, and it would be misleading if I didn't say that the only thing that people are coming here for is the Good Speed Opera House. Um, there's wonderful ice cream at the ice cream shop, but they're not coming to town for the ice cream. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, we want to have a destination that is really uh, for the patrons and the lovers of the performing arts. Um, it obviously capitalizes on the good speed and um, also the New England River Village that is so charming and lovely. Um, our second, oh, let me just quickly say, here's the good speed. I just want to tout why this is so important. Um, good speed, as many of you know, um, uh, is home to, uh, of the American Musical Theater. Um, it's actually the birthplace of a lot of major Broadway hits from Man of La Mancha to Annie, Shenandoah, Conway. A lot of hits start here at Goodspeed. And then of course the revivals that Goodspeed does are just, uh, they rival anything on Broadway in New York. Um, but what people may not know is that there is an entire campus of um, rehearsal halls the biggest musical library, paint shops that are, match anything in the, in the country, uh, scene shops, costume shops, wig shops, prop shops, um, and probably the largest costume collection you've ever seen. This is all right here in, in, in East Haddam on this incredible campus. And it's a phenomenal chance to see kind of behind the scenes of what, what goes into a, a musical production. So our, one of our hopes is to have a kind of a jitney bus tour of the campus itself. Uh, we also are sit, amazingly enough, um, right in the middle of about 30 really fantastic uh, theater venues, uh, from the Guard Theater in New London to the Yale Rep and the Long Wharf to Hartford Stage. We're right smack in the middle. So having people come to East Haddam to see a show at the Good Speed and then take in maybe another couple of nights of shows all around is uh, a real viable uh, destination goal. Uh, the second goal is to just simply have a creative boon 
uh, to the economic development of, uh, of East Hammer, and I touched upon that with a grand list and raising property values. But uh, importantly, we want to really stimulate the local um, and regional economic uh, activity. Um, so air, all the shops that we're in, anticipating are local, locally owned, locally operated. And there's nothing, no national stores or anything like that in, our, in mind. And then the last, which is a real tricky thing to do, is to keep it and create it as a center for the East Haddam community. And um, I'll hopefully be able to show how we're doing that. But we really want to attract um, and support locally owned stores and shops and restaurants and businesses and events. Um, so how do you take the home of the American musical, this great destination, this huge asset that we all benefit from, um, and make it into uh, a destination for theater lovers and as well a center for uh, our community. So there are a bunch of things I think are really critical. One is um, to cre <clears throat> create or have certain connections to our history. Um, that's what will give us authenticity. Um, we have to take care of the pedestrian because um, nobody spends a lot of time driving around in their car in a small little village. They walk around. Uh, there needs to be a memorable village core, and I'll explain that a little bit further. Um, then creating a, a communal vi village green. This is truly a, a, a community asset um, that, that we hope the people in town will uh, use. Um, we want, as I said, small locally owned shops. Um, there need to be dining options, um, and the Pollards can talk at length about uh, why having options is really critical. We want to bring some residential life into town. Uh, obviously, we need to connect, make connections to the river. Um, we want to take care of the environment. In fact, we want to be known for taking care of the environment. And last, we want to have activities for our children. So I'm going to go down this list. I'll try and be really fast. Believe it or not, I cut the number of slides in half from what you all saw online. It may not appear that way, but um, I did. Um, so uh, what's really interesting um, in the history of the town is that Good Speed Lending was really a vibrant, uh, very active commercial center. It employed over 400 people in, just in the village here. And you can see in the part, part that Swingbridge Landing is going to occupy, there's a pretty dense um, collection of buildings. And that was before the Opera House was built. Um, another part of the history is that uh, uh, the mill buildings in, in town, and the reason I mention that is for one simple but very, I think, powerful uh, reason. And that is, um, you know, as you probably know, it all made um, twine and uh, cotton products, gill netting and, and uh, blue jean stuff. Um, and they were done in these mills. And the mills each had a bell tower on them. And a uh, big bell inside every one of these mills. There were, I think, 12 along the Moodis River. And as the water was released um, through the sluice way um, out of the uh, Moodis Reservoir and down the Moodis River, each mill building would ring its bell to let you know that the water was coming. And that was going to open up the, um, the uh, uh, mill for work that day. So it was this kind of wonderful symphony of bells ringing down the river. And we'd actually love to try and kind of capture that little tidbit of history. Um, and uh, I think you'll see in a kind of uh, persuasive way. But here we are in the old town. Uh, William Goodspeed built his house there in 1938. Um, then the, the Gelson House, as we know it today, was built in 1953. And it wasn't until 19, I mean 1876 that the Opera House was actually built. Um, it created, those buildings created a, a place that was actually called Goodspeed Plaza. And it was a wonderful pedestrian zone um, that was written about and people talked about all the time. In 1903, the Goodspeed Mansion burned down. 
About 10 years later, the bridge was built. And with the bridge came cars, and with all of that, the Goodspeed Plaza disappeared. Um, around that time, as well, the steamboat traffic disappeared. And what was this wonderful opera house um, just became abandoned and was literally on the brink of being torn down in 1952. And that's when Al Selden and a bunch of other people um, and, uh, and, and eventually Michael Price um, came together and, uh, and rebuilt um, the opera house. What people may not realize is that everything on the first two floors of the opera house is completely fabricated. It has nothing to do with the original building at all. The theater part was um, actually a, a restoration, although it, the original building had flat floor and loose chairs. But um, what's, I think, wonderful is that people are finally now, including the um, zone Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, realizing that today the village is really poised um, to become an area of vibrant economic and cultural activity. Uh, it really has a chance to do that. And we plan to kind of recapture that vit vitality um, and uh, kind of make this memorable village core with its pedestrian uh, plaza. And, uh, and we're actually going to try and um, uh, recreate the William Gillette, uh, um, William uh, Goodbead uh, Mansion. Um, and there it sits. Uh, helping us along is the renovation of the swing bridge, and we're very pleased that uh, they agreed to put the sidewalk on the, on, the, on the side of the bridge. It will transform uh, our efforts um, because we'll be able to utilize the S-16 train, uh, the boating, the boat trips, the Eagle Landing parking lot, all of that. Um, Plus, standing on the, just walking on the bridge is a wonderful trip, and standing on the bridge during river festivals and that sort of thing is a marvelous thing to do. Um, the history of the property, um, part of it was, uh, belonged to the Diamond Match Company um, and was uh, uh, sold to the town in 1957. Um, the other part was purchased by the town from the state for $59,000, and I was very careful to calculate what that was in today's dollars, and it is $343,915, and we're paying a hell of a lot more than that, I can tell you, for uh, the property. Um, the, one of the things about the uh, site is that there, the two um, access points to it right now were condemned by the Department of Transportation, and they required that we locate the entrance exit up at the north end um, for sightline reasons. That required us to buy the Goodspeed property that that access road had to go through. So there's one acquisition we have to make. We have an agreement to purchase the Pelletier property just south of that so that the actual uh, Swing Bridge Landing site will be a 3.72 acre site. Um, now there are some abutting properties and we know that there's some people here who live in abutting properties and, and you know, the, it, it, it really is important to say that there's a very long process from here on out to talking to abutters and so forth. But let me just say that La Vida, we love having La Vida there. We've talked to Jackie. Um, the back side of La Vida is a mess. Uh, visually, and uh, it makes great pizzas, but it's a visual mess. Um, and we hope to be able to um, somehow let La Vida use our parking lot. Um, the Bogan property uh, needs a tenant, um, and, uh, and probably the use of our parking lot as well. Um, the old garage, uh, Chevy garage, um, is kind of a real focal point in town it's when you come into it by car. So we'd like to imagine that something great will happen there. And the property just south of that, again, all owned by Goodfeed, um, is a good site for some buildings that we have to relocate. Um, the Clink property 
is uh, a special, beautiful property. Um, eventually, we'll want to have a, a river trail go through that, whether the property gets purchased or we don't know. I mean, all of these things are kind of in the, in the future. The Gelston House um, desperately needs some work, an uplift, you know, a, a facelift, and uh, we'd love to get it to have some more hotel rooms. Um, so all of those properties around us are uh, important, but for now, we're focused on this piece of property, and uh, the abutters are going to be um, a thought after we get this thing underway. Um, top, topographically, just quickly, the river is at elevation zero. Um, there is a 50-foot drop from the north end of the site to the southern end. Um, there's a ridge uh, that blocks most of the site from the river, um, and it's a 10-foot high bridge, ridge. Um, and then it's a 40-foot uh, uh, drop uh, from that ridge down to the river. Um, but along there is the old quarry, and it's really, if you ever have a chance to kind of scale down the cliff there, it's really quite remarkable, and we have some thoughts on how to take advantage of the quarry. The quarry, the stone out of quarry was used to build the base of the opera house. Um, and then uh, from Broom Road, uh, which is the Clink's um, access road, uh, down to the pavement, it, that's a, about an 18 foot drop. And so we, we have uh, thoughts on how to use that. Um, sewage and water, pretty straightforward. The town sewer system is right at our front door, it's perfect. It has more than enough excess capacity. Uh, we do have to put in a community water system, uh, which we will. Um, so Swing Bridge Landing, there are three components. One is the Village Green Complex, which has um, shops and restaurants, and then um, apartment or condo units on the upper two floors, um, and obviously a Village Green in the center of it. Um, the Main Street East Complex, which is all retail and some office, and then the Hillside Apartment, which is all uh, residential. Um, and here you see uh, those three components. Um, this is the uh, Village Green component complex, and what we really were trying to do here, I'll point out, is get a, a pieces out front, foreground pieces, that um, kind of tie in with La Vida, this being the Goodspeed Mansion. Um, this is the wheelhouse, which is a visitor center, and that's a restaurant. To get the um, uh, smaller scale elements out front um, that will add to the scale um, of, the, of the village. Um, on, the, on the Main Street East complex, um, you'll note that the eave lines on the Pelletier House are matched here, and then the eave line on the, on the Shaler House, Goodspeed owned house, are matched here. Um, so we're trying to, again, keep the scale uh, down. And then the mix of architectural styles is East Haddam is famous for. Yeah. Um, and then on the hillside apartments, we build into the hill and we get three floors. The first two floors are duplex units and then the very top floor are studio units. But it means on the, on the uphill side, it's only a very low one, one story, hardly even a one story um, uh, elevation. Um, what goes and what stays, uh, that's an aerial view of the site. Um, obviously, Pelletier House stays, the Shaler House stays. Um, there's a stone wall that many of you probably know about that, that is actually in the way of our sight line, so we're going to move that in. It used to be the foundation of a building there, so we're going to make the foundation of our new building. Um, the old garage building goes. Uh, the river house gets relocated, we're not quite sure where. Uh, and the old town hall, it also um, gets relocated, and uh, we have ideas for that, but nothing concrete. Um, and then in its place is the Goodspeed Mansion. Uh, the little generator shed uh, goes, it will actually get kind of consumed into our building. 
Um, parking. Uh, we, we broke the parking, 155 spaces, which is just slightly more than um, the minimum required. Um, and we broke it into five smaller lots. Um, and you'll have the in and out entrance up at the north where we have sight lines, um, an entrance only down in the south, and then uh, an entrance off of Broom Road for the seven studio apartments um, up there. Um, the parking will have a lot of uh, trees um, planted in it, and, um, and you can access, you can go through the building in a number of different places so that we really wanted to make sure that this side of the street could, could be um, accessed by our parking lot. Um, and then in big events, uh, the Eagle Landing parking lot can um, uh, be used and we'll have a jitney bus uh, traveling back and forth and the bridge itself is, is walkable. Um, right now, these are the number of driveways that exit onto Route 82, onto Main Street, and it's part of the reason it's such a uh, tricky traffic situation. Um, we're gonna reduce it by that much. So it will, it will be a significant reduction in traffic coming onto uh, Main Street. Um, what else here? Okay, so the existing road is here. I, can you see the, yeah. And we're gonna slightly move it um, so that the big, big trucks coming off the bridge can make that turn better. And it allows us to um, do these planters uh, in here. Um, that's Madison, Connecticut. Um, and, uh, and then it gives a, a bus lane, separate bus lane for buses coming to the opera house. Um, and then uh, a walking zone uh, down here, which got cut off in the the screen, but, um, and then we're going to add a, a number of historic um, uh, street lamps, and we feel like coming in off the bridge, when you come into this zone, you'll just naturally feel like it's a more pedestrian um, uh, area, and uh, traffic will slow down, we'll have uh, strobe lights on the, um, on the uh, sidewalk, or the crosswalk, um, and then obviously the traffic coming across the bridge. Um, so uh, uh, it, will, it will, I think, really slow the traffic down um, and you can kind of get some sense of it here. You can see the, the bus, bus path off to the right um, and here you can see that kind of pedestrian zone up in here um, that uh, is carved out by that planter strip. Um, here again is kind of sense of the pedestrian zone, pedestrian friendly zone. Uh, the memorable village core, um, uh, obviously we have the Goodspeed and the Gelson House and La Vida. Um, uh, we're going to get rid of the overhead um, power line, utility lines, that will be I think kind of essential. Um, then the restaurant building will be a focal point coming across the bridge. Uh, you've got the mansion, you've got our little wheelhouse visitor center, and then a, another building, not in our scope right now, but a building we hope will happen in the future. And those, those buildings form what we call this village core. It's really, they make almost kind of an outdoor room, if you will, that becomes the memorable um, part of the mem memorable experience. Um, so coming across the bridge, uh, and into the uh, village uh, core. Um, the uh, village green itself will be a, a center for all sorts of events, um, private events, but also community events. Um, it's uh, about a 7,000 square foot lawn. Uh, it will have a little wall, sitting wall, so that when you're sitting on the lawn, you you're actually can't see the traffic going by underneath unless it's a semi-truck. Um, there'll be two sets of stairs taking you up from the sidewalk as well as an elevator. Um, when you get up, there's uh, a, a, a terrace that surrounds the, uh, the lawn and a covered arcade uh, that 
covers the entrances to the shops and restaurants. Um, it creates a wonderful sun trap, um, and, and so the, the place will become, I think, habitable even in the summertime, I mean, in the wintertime. Got great views of the river. And here, as you're coming from the parking lot into, uh, into the Village Green, um, here we'll have a, a bell tower and the wonderful bells of Moodis um, can ring every so often, um, not, hopefully not too often. Um, and then uh, coming in past the bakery into the green, um, and this is a place where um, kids can be playing while mom and dad are, are uh, eating. Um, it's uh, got, I think, a wonderful ambiance of family and residents and, um, uh, and small shops. And in the evening, um, it can become a place for any number of uh, uh, celebrations or small performances. Um, then during the seasons, um, it might have a maypole in the springtime, uh, pumpkin carving festivals in the fall, um, Christmas tree lighting in the, in the winter, um, any number of community uh, gatherings. Um, the uh, whole area is about a 12,000 square foot event center um, in, enclosed by the uh, buildings. Uh, there'll be kind of a couple of little stage areas in there for small performances. Um, a part of the parking lot can be used for a farmer's market. Uh, we'll have wonderful access to the Music on the River Festival. Um, obviously, um, the sidewalk connects not only to the Essex Steam Train and, and, the, and the river cruise boats, but to the River House um, Event Center. And we'll have the Jitney bus running back and forth as well. Um, hopefully, a river walk. Uh, in the future, um, a, a dock uh, off of that river walk. Um, and, and chances for a wonderful river festival. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we'll have the Jitney bus do tours of the Goodseed campus. Um, here's the farmer's market in the parking lot. Uh, here is the uh, Jitney bus getting ready to take people on tour. Um, and then on the lower level, uh, we're going to have a, a bicycle center um, that uh, will rent bikes, repair bikes, and when you stop there, you can stop and have lunch up on one of the, the restaurant deck or step right next door and, and to, the juice, uh, to the juice bar and have a refreshment. Um, there'll also be a health club down below, which you can get to from within the apartments or from the street or from the juice bar or from the bike center. So uh, it's a whole health club um, that is got, will have a pool and uh, exercise equipment and golf training equipment for you know people uh, playing golf. Um, so uh, what's critical to this whole communal um, setup here are two things. One is the community events building, what we call the wheelhouse. Um, it has a bathroom in it, public bathroom in it for people at the music festival or in any, any kind of outdoor events. And it will have an information center that will dis disseminate um, information about all the regional uh, offerings around, which are huge. And, and if I've left anybody's sign off of this list, it's only because it didn't fit. Um, but it, they're, they're just a wonderful array of things. So you'll be able to buy tickets at the wheelhouse, uh, get schedules, um, get menus at restaurants, any number of things um, at, at, the, uh, at the wheelhouse. Um, the locally owned shops, they're small, um, and uh, these are just some, some target ideas that we have. We'd like to, we're gonna control, Mary and I are gonna completely control what kind of retail comes in here, and we, we're, we Gonna, as, as the Pollards say, we're going to curate the, uh, the um, shops, the retail shops. So one of the ideas is a book and music store, for kind of obvious reasons. Um, the Audubon shop, uh, which um, 
not only celebrates bird watching, um, but also the Roger Dory Peterson uh, legacy, which is just down the street. Um, and uh, many people don't know, bird watching is a $40 billion industry, annual industry. <laughs> um, we're gonna have a culinary shop where you can buy cookbooks and small uh, food wear and so forth, and a cooking school. Um, it's a, a really, a real cook's uh, center, if you will. Um, there'll be a bake shop uh, that can have coffee and, and kind of cafe eating outside. We have an entrance on the north side so you can park and, and, and grab and go really quickly. Um, the gift shop will be uh, really centered around uh, the history of Broadway musicals, the history of the river itself, um, and uh, uh, again, we want it to be a, a themed uh, gift shop. Um, there'll be a, a small outdoor outfitters uh, shop, largely oriented towards fishing and, um, and small boat uh, traffic. Um, We'll have an art, art store that will not only sell art goods, but have a, a gallery for artists, local artists. Um, and then a chocolate store down on the lower level, uh, and the bike store that I mentioned before, um, that is access from uh, the health club as well, and to the juice bar. On the east, um, the uh, Main Street East complex, um, on the left side, we're going to have a uh, barber shop and cigar store, maybe, or a pipe store, or something like that, um, and a beauty salon. Uh, up above, we're, gonna, we're attracting a music school. Um, <clears throat> the, on the right-hand side, down below, uh, there's a little plaza that connects across the street where the, the sweet shop is now. Um, and. Uh, and then down below we'll have kind of fitness equipment um, and foods and things like that. And then upstairs, um, something very close to Mary's in my heart, um, is a dance hall uh, that will give dance lessons, um, but have programs for all different ages. Um, it's amazing, tap dancing is not just for kids or young adults, um, but older folks as well. Um, modern dance, uh, line dancing, um, ballroom dancing, programs for kids, um, the shag, anybody know what the shag is? Um, it's, I've, I learned it's a dance you do with one arm so you can hold a drink in the other, that's all I know about the shag. Um, and then uh, square dancing, um, some hip hop, some break dancing, and then we thought we'd also avail ourselves occasionally of um, dancers from the Broadway shows at the good speed and have, uh, so a real wonderful community um, asset. Uh, if you want to bring people together, just start getting them to dance. Uh, the dining options, obviously we have Galston and La Vida. La Vida, we hope to give them some parking spaces so that they can maybe um, repair their kitchen area and move out into that little parking spot. We don't know quite yet, uh, but th that's not in our project anyhow. Um, but anyhow, in the, in the uh, Good Speed Mansion, we'll have, we're thinking kind of like a bistro type of thing. In the river, uh, tavern on the river, it's more of a um, ethnic food, um, outdoor dining, uh, fire pits so you can eat outdoors um, later in the season. Um, it may have um, a microbrewery in it, which has been popular. And then we hope to kind of take advantage of that little quarry space and make some kind of a little outdoor um, place to have a drink or maybe even sandwich kind of thing. Um, and then downstairs, the bake shop and the juice bar. Um, the dining options are, are really important. Um, they'll be outdoors as well as indoors. Uh, the, um, they'll be dining uh, with 
uh, right on the river, looking out over the river. Um, and of course, dining, the combination of dining and theater is always a very powerful one, um, where um, lunch turns into dinner, and then a show, and then uh, after show, uh, dining or, or nightclubbing. Uh, the residential life um, in, the, in the Village Green, there'll be condos um, that, as I said, could become B&Bs um, and with river condos um, and a business center so that um, it's really oriented towards the work, live, play uh, market. Um, on the hillside residence, it's, as I said, uh, duplex down below and the small studios up above. Um, and the connections to the river, um, hopefully a river walk, uh, the river deck with its uh, esplanade. Um, we're thinking of putting some kind of a little gazebo out there so the public can get out onto the edge of the land and look out over the river. Um, uh, and the little grotto that I mentioned before, the quarry, um, a future dock, hopefully, uh, wonderful views of the river, uh, stores that are oriented towards the river, um, the sidewalk on the bridge, which becomes a wonderful venue for um, uh, river festivals, obviously the music on the river festival, um, and the wheelhouse that is selling tickets to all this stuff, and maybe even some um, pilot's licenses for seaplane operation. Um, last uh, couple of things, uh, care for the environment. Um, we're going to have everything we can possibly have, from geothermal to photovoltaics to passive solar uh, sun traps, um, uh, solar walls, uh, super insulated stuff, vegetative roofs, bird friendly glass, LED lighting, non toxic renewable materials, and so forth. So, a lot of um, care and attention given to the environment. Um, and then, last, uh, the children's activities. With all of these facilities, um, we can have children programmed, and, and Mary and I have even talked about having a children's summer camp that involves dance programs, for obvious reasons, art programs, uh, nature walks, um, cooking lessons, story times, uh, bicycling, um, history exploration, picnics on the green, theater programs, swimming, playtime on the village green, and so forth. So a real chance to bring the kids uh, into, into the fold. Um, so uh, our hope is that um, we've We'll make connections to our history. We'll take care of the pedestrian. We'll uh, have a memorable village core and a communal village green, um, small locally owned shops, lots of dining options, residential life, connection to the river, care for the environment, and activities for our children. So with that, um, I'm gonna, we're going to wrap up with a little video. Some of you have seen it. Some of you have not, um, but kick back and just um, enjoy it uh, to the best you can. So um, I'm going to sit down. <laughs>
Okay. Um, <clears throat> so before we're, I think, I think we're going to actually take a little break here. Um, excuse me. I can't hear you. Okay. Can we wait to finish? So what we're going to do next, you're all set? I, I just want to say two more things and then we're okay. going to break. So, okay. um, so uh, before we break, um, I just I want to reemphasize a couple of things. One is um, that uh, um, we, there will be no sale of this property the town will maintain its ownership of the property up to the point where we have a building permit. And that means we will have um, not only received um, planning and zoning approval with public input, um, we will have uh, received all the approvals from environmental concerns, um, building department, fire, and all that. Um, we will also have uh, gotten um, private equity investment by then and, um, and uh, financial institution uh, loan agreements by then. We, we won't have a building permit without all of those things in place. So um, that's point number one. Point number two is um, the options uh, that all of you face are we could do nothing with the property and it could remain vacant. We could do something like this, um, or we could um, turn it into a, a parkland um, and the town could continue to own it and develop it as a, as a park. Or there may be a fourth option that hasn't occurred to me. Um, so um, what we're really asking for is, is for the town to give us, Mary and me, and, and our group, um, a, a chance to um, develop this thing further uh, with all of the necessary agency approvals um, and get it to a point where we have a building permit. Um, so that's all I want to say. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So we're going to take a short break. We're going to take a short break. Uh, can we reconvene? back at 8.15 if anybody needs to take a, a quick break and then we'll open up the Q&A comment session. That was so
Again, there's microphones on both sides. So if you want to line up behind them, we're going to limit, it this, limit each discussion, comment, question to three minutes initially. You'll have a second chance after everyone's had a chance to speak. If you feel comfortable identifying yourself, it makes it easier for us to uh, reference putting a name with the comments when we uh, put the minutes together for this meeting. So you do not have to, however. All right, we'll start right here with Ms. Gelston. as an individual, not as the wife of a board of finance member. I make sure I would tell my husband that. Closer so, okay. to the mic, please. I, I'm, speaking, I'm speaking as an individual. I to do something wonderful and beautiful downtown. However, I have a lot of problems. Number one, if you look at this picture, this is what came out. The very first thing that hit me was that the perspective is totally wrong. And to verify, we drove down there tonight to approximately where this view supposedly was taken from. The Goodspeed Opera House is not that distant and that small. It is three times larger because it's that close. Okay, that's one thing right there. And the perspective in most of the videos did the same thing. It's distorted. It makes everything look further apart and much more spacious. Um, the, the green is 7,000 square feet. That sounds like a big number. It's one-sixth of one acre. That's not a large area for people getting together, especially you know, nowadays with social distancing and whatnot. Not a lot of people could be there. My other problem is that with that number of shops, and uh, the, I'm sure that if it's done to the scale, the rents will be sizable. So the shops are going to have to generate a big volume to be able to have the profit to be able to be paying the rent. And it's going to increase traffic tremendously over the bridge. And I don't feel that there's enough parking spaces for the people that are going to be, you know, working at the shops and living in the apartments, as well as what we want to draw for people coming into town to spend their money here. So that's another issue. And with that volume of traffic going through, it's going to back up terribly every time the bridge is open. Then we're going to get all of the exhaust fumes, because not everyone is kind enough to shut off their engine while they wait for the bridge to open. It would be nice if they did. And the volume of people that are going to be staying there permanently, I feel, is a higher density than what is optimum. I would really like to see you folks scale this down to where it's reasonable as far as numbers and space. And it's just, it's so much in such a small area that it's, it's too much. I mean, it, it's, it's cluttered looking. And it looks lovely in the videos, but whenever you look at it, it's the angles. I mean, I, I specifically have seen ads, especially realtors are good at this. And you go, oh, look at that house. It's lovely. It's set way back from the road. And it's all about the perspective. You drive there, it's, it's nowhere near as far. And I'm afraid this is the case here, because as I said, we went down there and looked. And the, the good speed from here would have come up to this. It's three times closer. And so I think it's, as I said, it's a great idea, but it's too much in too little area. And I don't see how all of those businesses are going to sustain themselves, and not without a huge influx of traffic, which is going to pose its own problem. So is that my three minutes? OK, thank you. Bye. There won't be comments then. Hi, uh, Casey Carl. I support very much this idea and really appreciate 
the amount of effort that had gone into the planning from everyone involved all the way back a decade and a half. Thank you all very much. The personal aspects you put in this to connect it to the history of the town and the way you customize it to our village, very impressive. And yeah, it's a grand concept, and I do imagine eventually it won't be as grand, but I like where it's starting, I like potential where it's going. I have concerns, and I wanted to see the landing happen for a very long time, so thanks again for that. Um, I have concerns about the big picture of the bridge being refurbished in a time frame that I'd like you to speak to in terms of how it overlaps the time frame of this construction. There are many people who are concerned about the bridge project for those who have businesses in town affecting you know, the traffic coming in and out. Those of us who make our living, as I do as a live stage performer, who have to leave town regularly also have issues of getting to where we need to go in a certain amount of time. The DOT is, I think, doing a pretty good job of laying out the bridge schedule so that people have an idea of when it's closed and when it's not. Would the construction of this project first happen within the same zone of time, you know, year that this is happening? Secondly, will you be able to establish a way for us to know when projects related to this could also you know, limit our ability to get across the river? Is there a way to communicate that as well as DOT is planning to? Not that anything's in stone and there'll be weather issues, but if you could address that and perhaps alleviate some concerns that the double whammy of these projects could create even more havoc for those of us who have to leave regularly or want to come back. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, the question, those questions on, unfortunately don't have answers right now, um, except to say that um, uh, I've been um, the architect at Quinnipiac University for over 40 years. And if you think this is complicated, try doing a multi-phase um, renovation of a student center while you keep all the students in the center eating and, and doing so. Th th these are all, always seem insurmountable problems at first, but when you sit down and really work at it, um, you figure out uh, ways to get around it. Or I know already some shopkeepers are, are, are <clears throat> working with their customers to um, develop alternative routes down, uh, you know, to or uh, other ways of getting around the bridge. Our thought was that if our construction, heavy construction coincides with the bridge construction, that's actually going to be a plus because you just get it over with all at once rather than prolong it for another couple of years. So. Um, anyhow, very, they're, they're tricky, difficult questions to, or issues to resolve, but I've never not had them resolved. They always get resolved. Um, I can't give you any more reassurance than that. I think that's every, I know that's the intention of the bridge construction is to, is to they've worked really hard at, at um, aligning their construction schedule with, um, for instance, the Good Speed Opera House's shows, um, any number of, of um, kind of time critical operations. Um, yeah, I think you just have to um, care enough about it that you, um, get solutions to it. But we, we're, we're so far from, we're probably three years away from heavy construction <laughs> at, at best, if that's if everything goes really smoothly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Albert Vissio. A couple of comments kind of on the overarching. A uh, little background, I spent some time on the Board of Finance of the town of Reading in Fairfield County. Uh, I also spent some time on the Mayor's Finance Advisory Committee in San Francisco for the construction of the San Francisco Giants Stadium with the intent of not having any public money. Okay, can you see that? Um, there are a couple of things that, that just happened. One, there's gonna be an enthusiastic crowd, pro. Those are the people who are going to show up 
in droves for any referendum. All right, we know who those people are. They're the ones that have the interest. If we saw them on the board. They might have the properties near there or they have businesses. Uh, so I think it's incumbent upon town government to make sure the right stuff is in the referendum, which brings me to part two. Any development project, I've worked on projects all over the world, they all run into problems of being too slow. So we had beautiful presentations by our developer, didn't have your graphics, I wish we had those, they're really impressive, but you forgot the masks. But, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but what happens is you get these things and every, everything is good, everything is good, and then you get the updates. The state is dragging its feet. We don't have the approvals. It's taking time, taking time. Oops, we're running out of money. Now we need your help from the town. We can't go through unless we get help from the town. So they said, well, we have a way of doing it which isn't going to cost you anything, which is called a TIF. And you've gone through that, which is the town borrows money paid by revenue from taxes. My objection to that was there are no revenues until there are revenues. It goes to referendum. All the enthusiasts go there, gets approved, goes to the state. Thank God the state is slow, did not get approved. When financial crisis hit, project goes belly up. If it had gotten approved, taxpayers of Reading would be on hook from 2008 to now because that property, which was an old mill on the Norwalk River, is still vacant, underutilized, I mean, not, not utilized, no tax money at all. So I saw in your documents here that you list, you want approval for you to go to this project and give possibly a TIF. I think you have to separate the financing. We can talk about is the project a good idea or not, I don't know. I mean, that's smarter people can determine that. But in terms of funding it, I don't think it should be on the backs of the taxpayers to take the risk while another party is going to get the benefits. I think those have to be married. We did that with the baseball stadium. I tried like hell to do that in the town of Reading, and I really want to see that here. I can't support signing up for a blank check, which is what you're doing with the taxpayers. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Hello, um, my name is John Olin, and um, I agree with um, what has been said, um, but I'd like to make a slightly different point. Um, I think this project blurs the boundaries of art and reality. Um, and I think maybe that's, that comes from um, the fact that the town is a venue for art. It's a, it's a venue for dreams, a, a venue for um, the man from La Mancha. We are not from La Mancha. We're from East Haddam, a little Connecticut river town filled with New Englanders, modest New Englanders, and we don't want a top-down director, I, at least I don't. My, my background is in community development internationally, and one of the first things that, that we do when we come into a place is we work from the bottom up and that's what this meeting is. It's, this is the bottom. We're, we're the, the people. And to give the power of our future, the power of, of designing a future, um, a Disney-esque commercial future in someone's dream um, to one person, to one group, is, is it's not um, consistent with everything that I learned in my three quarters of a century um, is what, what uh, citizenship in America is all about. And I've lived in New England towns, and I know New England towns inside and out. And I'd rather have the good and the bad of that um, than some kind of artificial, imposed, um, $51 million um, extravaganza that might be better done on a stage <clears throat> with the denouement of, of a shattered hubris, then um, uh, I'd rather live in reality. 
I'd rather see a community from the ground up. Individuals create community. Outsiders, even if it's an, in, an outsider that's lived inside, one person doesn't create community. It's an organic process. And that should be understandable to people. But in our commercialized society, we've forgotten that. And we fall victim, we fall prey to people who would earn livings, big livings. And mind you, did you notice any great diversity up there? At blacks? Any uh, uh, handicapped people? Now maybe they think of that, but you know, half a million people in this state are on, uh, uh, dependent on, on food banks. Uh, we live in a world in crisis. We live in a world where, where we don't really know what the future is going to be. In 10 years, we don't John, know time. what your time, John. plan is going to be. But it's going to turn out. Hi, I'm, I'm Jonathan Silvers. Uh, my family's been in this town for over 100 years. And I'll say right now at this point. Jonathan, could you come closer to the mic, please? Sure. My family's been in this town for 100 years. And if this product goes through my house, goes on the market. Um, I, I've seen fantasies before. Um, I know many directors. Um, but I didn't see reality in this video. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering um, how you ex expect us to accept this when there's a complete absence of vehicles, cars, in most of the, um, the sequences you put up in the film. I assume that that was a deliberate omission. But the reality will be density and traffic will be nightmarish, nightmarish. And I'm wondering who's evaluating that. I'm also asking the town, humbly requesting that the town give those of us who oppose this development, this scale of development, equal time, and certainly time to put together our own film that might show the environmental reality of, of this um, kind of a project. Um, I just want to note, too, that there is a pre-COVID reality and there's a post-COVID reality. And I don't think anyone has calibrated the post-COVID reality yet. We don't even know what the world is going to look like in a month, let alone two, three, ten years from now. And this has implications for generations. And I don't want to go into the destruction of Buddhists because I recognize that that was a different world as well. But I do want to note that pre-COVID, there were enormous numbers of vacancies in Saybrook and Chester, and they were on the rise. My favorite store was North Cove Outfitters. I know you have a fisherman's tackle shop or some sporting goods store in your, in your scenario. North Cove went bust. Um, there's, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a cooking store in Chester that I believe is struggling. Um, we've seen enormous turnover in Chester lately, certainly in, Cent I'm sorry, in Irving, um, Irvington? Um, I forget the name of the town. In, in, in any case, I think that we need to take a step back and recalibrate and think about what the town needs. I think a strong interval would be, an uh, intermittent step would be to turn this place into a park, do the remediation that's necessary, and let the town actually enjoy it for a change. Instead of pushing forward with the development at a time when the bridge is going to be out of commission for two plus years and they're building a roundabout in Tylerville, we have an awful lot to consider and one proposal after 10 years is an insufficient, I think, amount of time, I'm sorry, an insufficient number of proposals to consider. We really don't know what's going to happen, and we need far more time to consider it. Evening, I'm Mark Walter, 10 Deer Run. I've been the uh, first selectman here since 2007 for 10 years, and till 2016. The this project has been on the drawing board since then. And thankful to Mary and Jeff for coming through with a proposal that has great opportunity for this town. If you just go to Watch Hill in Rhode Island, the hotel, and see the caliber of the work that they perform, it's amazing. I feel that if we do nothing and ignore this great opportunity, the old DOT garage in the center of our beautiful village will rot. The river house, the historic river house will rot. And our old town hall will rot. And it will be an eyesore that will detract from the incredible opportunity this town holds. I agree that what was presented here tonight 
seems amazing and in large scale. The reality is it might not, it might take phases to accomplish everything. And it might change dramatically from what was presented, but it has to go through all the boards and commissions, historic district, planning and zoning. None of this will happen overnight. It'll be years in the process. But the key is if you kill it, the village will die, I think. And I think this is a rare opportunity to build something. I, I'm a private pilot, and my dad was as well. We flew all over New England, and we would go to destination airports. It had great restaurants. We'd go to Hyannis on the Cape. We'd go to Nantucket. But we went to places that had an opportunity for retail and restaurants. You have a river that has traffic from Hartford all the way to Old Saybrook with thousands of boats all summer long looking for a place to dock, have a nice meal, and do a little shopping. I think what was proposed here is right on and could really put us on the map as a place to visit and have a wonderful time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa McNellis. Um, I moved to Main Street um, 19 years ago, and I originally moved here because I wanted to live in a village. And I volunteered with um, the Revitalization Committee. It must be 10 years. And so I give you guys a lot of credit for sticking with this as long as you have. Um, I think this is a great opportunity um, the presentation was really wonderful. My concern is mostly overwhelming the space, visually overwhelming that little, what seems to be a little space. You know, when, when we looked at plans for um, the actor housing, it, it really comes out a lot different than it looks on paper. But I, I, I love the direction, and I think it's a great opportunity. Um, our our life will be, you know, hell for a couple years going through this, but I think it's well worth it. And I um, just wanted to thank you for that and the work you've all put in. So I hope something finally happens with to move some things along because I know I've certainly waited a long time. Thank you. Hi. Kim Dodge. Um, it was a lovely film. It was a production to rival a show at the good speed. And we all love the good speed. But one thing that's missing in your history um, is the fact that the good speed doesn't pay taxes in this town. And um, we as taxpayers, to fill in your history gap a little bit, kicked in money so that uh, we could put in sewers for the benefit of the village. And now the concern, uh, my concern, and I think I speak for many other people in town, a town of 7,000 people, and we're talking about the little village here, but it's a, a key to uh, the people who live and work in this community to be able to cross the river. It's the shortest crossing to the river. And there are no other access crossings within 20 miles in either direction. Already it's a nightmare. Just as a general capacity of, of cars and trucks and traffic crossing the river. And now because of repairs that need to be made, uh, to the inadequate bridge that was built a century ago, uh, a bridge that we've dumped millions of dollars into for its historic lovely value in our lovely village. Um, but for those of us who live in the real world, those of us who uh, support businesses in our own community and uh, businesses that due to COVID have, are failing, Businesses, because of the bridge closing for repairs, are concerned about the viability of their, bridge, of their business. And these are the folks that supported the community through COVID. Uh, 
businesses like Shagbark and Balix and Chest Elm and uh, I just really don't see how those of us it seems that we're trapped here a little bit because we have planes crossing boats going under railroad tracks cross the bridge and we're trying to get to work and home at the end of the day there is a capacity of traffic that is already uh, almost un unsustainable. Um, and for the sake of our historic bridge, we have not produced a modern, efficient crossing to the river. And remember the river, the river that we all love? Maybe people would appreciate just being able to sit at a park in our village. It doesn't have to rot. We could contribute and use the space that is our land. Um, right now, our taxes are going up, and they've gone up every year. Uh, the mill rate has gone up a point, 10 points in the last 10 Time, years. Please. And I'm sure that you would be perfectly happy to tax residents, have people that have lived in town for 100 years, force them to sell their homes Ms. Downs, to time. pay it to the next highest taxpayer. But thank you. Hello. Um, so, my name is... Oh, uh, I'm going to uh, just respond for okay. a quick second. Um, there have been a number of comments about um, the options for the property which I think I mentioned uh, um, uh, at, at the outset or at least a few moments ago. Um, the options are it could become a, a town park. I mean, Mar Mary and I are in this, believe me, not for the money. I can tell you right now, um, there's n nothing coming our way. Um, we're in it because we love the town and we want the best thing for the town. Um, and the option might be that it becomes a park, that the town um, pays the money to develop it into a park, fixes it up, demolishes the buildings, um, and no longer has any um, tax revenue. That's um, a possibility. Um, the other possibility is it gets developed, and, and, uh, and I can tell you that um, uh, you know, a lot of people have mentioned this is a pipe dream and so forth. Um, I've been at this for, I've been an architect for 55 years. I have done these things forever. You have to start off with a vision. If you start off with the nuts and bolts and you start off in the basement, you're, you're not even going to get the basement. You have to start off with a vision and, and then you work hard to make the vision a reality. And the reality is, you're right, never exactly what the vision was, but um, you have to start with the big picture. Um, the third option is you just let it sit and rot. There are other options. Great. I'm all ears. Go okay. for it. First of all, um, I'm going to, to say that I find that uh, we were told that you're supposed to be masked here, and so as marketing people, I would think that it would be uh, really better for the whole group if you uh, um, did what everyone else is supposed to do. That shows, you know, that you have respect for our community and for our school rules. So um, that I think is something that is demeaning to your group is that you don't even respect the rules of our community. And, um, you know, I know where you live, and um, you are the only house that shows on Seven Sisters. So as an architect, there's a lot of um, hubris, I think, in putting your house as the only house that shows. There are a lot of other houses on that, um, on that ri rise, and you're the only house that shows. So in some sort of way, Talking about um, a vision, your vision is one that puts you in center. 
And that is not a good vision when you want to create something that is community-based. So that's, um, you know, just to begin with. Um, this is sort of a Disney World kind of view of, of, a, of a center. It has nothing to do with the integral part of a, a New England town. I sat yesterday in, on Creamery Road in one of the houses that was built, I think, by um, Goodspeed for his um, nephews or something like that a long time ago. And um, all the people there, all around, including the person who, who, who bought the, um, the airport, are living in pretty modest and beautiful houses. And, um, and they're all musicians. Everyone around there is a musician. And, and, and there's a kind of a feeling of the town that has nothing to do with good speed. You were talking about a bookstore. We already have a little bookstore. And you, your bookstore is going to take him out of business. You are not really thinking of the people that live there. You're thinking of uh, this, making this a destination that is not integral to our society. Um, there, um, it's uh, in terms of the um, of the um, you know your plan itself that round building with the bricks coming in from the, the, the bridge is very unappealing. Um, I would not want that as as the first thing that I would see when I come into town. Um, there time, are, please. My time's up. Okay, there are a lot more, but um, I think you understand that I'm very much against this proposal and that I hope that we do not uh, go on with it. Hi, my name is Terry Anderson Murray. I've lived in this town for 56 years, born and raised here, where I do agree that there is some um, need to do something down there so things don't rot. I think this proposal is way out of East Haddam's league. It is way too big. It doesn't keep the community's bedroom town feeling that's here. That's why I have stayed and lived in the same house my entire life, raised my children here. I think there could be a compromise, like Mark said, you know, he was a pilot, he flies where there's restaurants and shops. I think there could be downscaled to the point where it could be a absolute um, compromise between what the town wants and I'm not an architect, I'm a nurse, but I gotta get across that river every day and come home every day. And I think there needs to be a compromise between the town and the people. There's a lot of good thoughts out here tonight and I really hope everybody in this panel takes that into consideration. Oh, my name is Dean Paletti. Lived here for a number of years. Um, I want to first thank the revitalization team and all their all their work over the years. Uh, this is not an easy job for them to do. Nothing in this town is. Um, CBG, thank you for making a presentation. Everybody has an opinion. We all have our own opinions of this process. But as it's been said. This is the first step. It isn't lock and stone. That building isn't going to be exactly like that. The people, the tree won't be in the center. It won't be 3.6 feet here and like that. This is a first step. When the Good Speed Opera House, when was it, 56, someone said on the thing, that was a town garage. You saw the garage doors. They were going to tear that down, and somebody had the vision to do something with that. If that was torn down as a crappy old garage that used to be like where the riverboat come up and they would be coming in from the short the water and go upstairs for the businesses years ago. If they, someone didn't have the vision to fix that place, it would have been torn down and you wouldn't have anything there but a big hole, probably. So, like I say, thank you for putting something on the table, something to chew on. Obviously, it's not going to be built next year. He's saying three years. It's going to take three years just for the paperwork in this town. 
So, good, you know, like I said, the good speed there. Now, the garage we got there today, the town garage that's in the back that's getting, it's an eyesore. It's been an eyesore for decades. It's got crap in the ground, PCBs and whatever else we got down there. They're offering to clean that up at their dime. Am I correct in that? All right, I don't want to have my taxes go up to support this if it goes like halfway and falls down. But it's a start, potentially, to grow it. Personally, I think it's a little bit grandiose with all the buildings. It's, it's just tight. I, I like the general idea of it. It's a good start. The businesses and stuff, because that's what a little town will have, little businesses and some uh, housing and whatnot. We don't have a half a dozen teams making presentations over the last decade. We've had one, okay? So don't kick the one that comes and offers their hand. Don't bite the hand that feeds you, in a manner of speaking. You know, give them a chance. It may not work out, but give them a chance. It's still fluid. Now, the traffic is terrible there. I was there this last weekend. The bridge opened up for a boat. It took over 20 minutes for that one lane each way to clear where it actually was maybe one or two cars on the bridge. This is during the middle of the day, like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So with that thought, the way the traffic is today, adding the extra businesses in the walkway, that is something that we all have to be cognizant of, is the traffic. Because it, and then being nice, people are going to be, you know how the, the rubberneckers are. Oh, look at that. Boom. Time, please. So, you know, with all those type of things, we got to take that step. But I do want to thank you and, and the revitalized, revitalization team for their effort. But everybody has an opinion. I'm glad to hear a variety of opinions here today. Thank you. Walk Pearl, um, mention was just made of the bookstore that you proposed in there and the relation to the book, used book and record store that's currently located, I believe, behind the sweet shop. You mentioned at the start of your presentation that I think the word you used was curating the businesses that would be present in this development. I'm curious if you can speak to any sort of non-competition clause or any um, let's say, concessions made to ensure that businesses that are already in the village are not outcompeted by businesses that are coming in. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask the Pollers to address this um, after I say one thing. Um, we have zero intention of, of wiping out existing stores. We've talked to a number of uh, store owners but we still have ahead of us a lot of conversations with local store owners. We have had people who have local stores or regional stores who have said, gee, we want to come and move into your place. No, I can't. And this, this, uh, who is that, Mr. Silvers? No, you know I can't. It, it's, pri it's privy conversation. So um, uh, uh, at any rate, um, uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to the callers who have a great deal of experience in doing just exactly this. Um, and John, do you want to, John or Karen, do you want to? Uh, I want to assure everybody that when we looked at being involved in this project, um, we're from a small town too, we're in Middlebury, Connecticut, and um, our vision when we look at this in terms of tenant mix um, restaurant and retail is more like Woodbury or Litchfield. I don't know if anybody has been to those hounds. You know, I understand that that's a streetscape, um, but that's the type of leasing that we're looking at here is there are small local owned businesses. We would be very cognizant to look at what's already in this town to be sure that we're not cutting the pie because that's not the intent. The intent is to try to draw more customers 
um, to the existing businesses by having a little bit more to offer so that instead of somebody coming to visit this area maybe twice a year, they might come once a month, um, which is what we found happened in Woodbury and what happened in Litchfield. Um, so that's, that's the direction we're going in. We certainly don't want to put anybody out of business. We just want to be able to try to add to what's here to make it a more enjoyable experience for the residents and for the people that do come to visit. You can ask that question in a minute if you want to come back up. Okay. Hi, my name is Elena Kotowski. Um, I lived, I moved in East Haddam when I was in sixth grade, so I went to elementary school prior to they separated it into middle school. Um, I was last graduating class from Hillbury in 1994 from where we have the town hall now. So I've been here for a while, but I, I moved out and I've come back. But um, I've recently come back, and uh, I really hate having to drive a half an hour to get to anything. I think this plan is great. It will save us a lot of money on gas. There will be um, a lot of wonderful shops that the community can support. I think it has a lot of opportunity for people to come and visit East Haddam and get to know East Haddam. I think we're missing out on a lot of revenue because the Gelson House gets busloads of people, and where do they go? They only have two options. That's it. I mean, you want this to be a destination because you have so many great elements. Like at Mystic, if you see that place in the summertime, it is packed. It is so busy. And they don't have the Good Speed Opera House. They don't have, um, you know, the, the beautiful bridge, the sort of bridge that seems to break down a lot. But the solution for the bridge is just to put up a sign that says, go away, do not enter. So we don't ever have to open the bridge, right? Um, but think about the tax revenues. There's so many roads that aren't paved in East Haddam and Ludus. Um, you know, BB Road's not paved. I just think but also one of the benefits from what I see of this is that it's in the beginning of East Haddam. It doesn't impact the rest of the town. So you're not like having to deal with traffic everywhere else. Um, I think it's a beautiful design. I think it represents what villages are, small, compact areas. Um, and then uh, I'm, I feel like you should actually build a hotel higher so you should, can get more people in there. Um, and I don't know if you have any height restrictions. Um, and then another thing that I think might be added, um, maybe put a skywalk going across the street so you don't have pedestrians going across the street because when people do cross the street right now, um, it, it's kind of scary, you know, and if there's going to be more traffic, if a skyway was built or something, you know, you see them in Vegas, you see them in Minneapolis, they're great. You don't have to deal with traffic and it's safer for pedestrians too. Um, so. I think this is a great project. It will save me a lot of money on gas. It's beautiful. I mean, and when people ask me how far is anything from my house, everywhere you go, it's always a half an hour. Nothing's 10 minutes away. There's just nothing 10 minutes away. Grocery stores, half an hour. Um, if you want to go anywhere, you usually have to go to another town. Why not keep it here and get the tax money from it? It just makes sense. There's already a parking lot there. There, there's, a, there's already a parking lot there. Yeah. Um, can I? Uh, and I think it might uh, slightly address a comment that came from over here as well. Um, in the 2019-2029 um, plan of conservation development, um, they published some numbers that are quite, I think, remarkable. Um, the town has a $97.6 million local, local spending potential. And I'll repeat that, a $97.6 million local spending potential. It spends locally $16.3 million. 
that 17 percent of its spending potential is spent in town. And why do you think that is? There's no place to spend the money. <laughs> I mean, not no place, but there are very few places. And people go far, they, they travel to uh, buy things, eat meals, um, and so forth. So there's a tremendous amount of in-town potential just for this project. Flying Roy, remember you talk about spending potential? People spend money on food, gasoline, and none of that are in this project. So it's, it's the spending, household spending, is big in food, fuel, housing, none of that's part of this. So those little shops are not going to generate big chunks of money. You'd need a Costco, you'd need a big Y to get that kind of spending. Um, the, the whole issue, this is not a shopping center. Right. This is not a shopping center, folks. This is a residential um, development with uh, retail um, aspects to it and dining aspects to it. It, it, a shopping center needs anchor stores, it needs to have the shop, whatever. It has to have the A&P, which Moody's didn't get. Um, but it, it is its destination, its anchor store, if you will, are the Goodspeed Opera House, the Essex Steam Train, the uh, River Cruise Boats, um, the Gillette Castle. Those, those, are the things that, uh, those are the things that draw people to this area. And, and we're, we're, what our project is trying to do is, is enhance those entities to um, uh, give them support so that they can actually exist far into the future. Um, I can tell you that, you know, uh, theaters are very tricky things to make work financially and they need to have um, people come uh, from far away um, and and uh, actually come here, spend the night, maybe see two shows, have meals, do some shopping. That's, what, that's what's going to draw people to this village. And as I said, you know, we could make a town park out of it, and it's not going to do anything for good speed, and it won't do anything for the village. It will just... Folks, uh, please come up to the mics when you have comments. Hi, my name is Jen Hain, and um, I moved to the area in September, in last September, but I was drawn to the area um, by my dear friend Julia Balfour, who opened Julia Yoga. So um, I didn't know much about this area. I came here a few times to see a show at the Good Speed, but other than that, it was just this place on the other side of the river. Um, today, I live and I work in the village, and I love it so much. Um, I walk the streets, I go to the local shops, you know, I walk to the post office, I love the neighbors, I go down, you know, to the river to sit before work, after work. It's a beautiful area. Um, I am really excited that we're having this conversation. Um, Julia's not with us today, but I'm here with my coworker, Shay, and we know that um, Julia was very excited to have these conversations with Jeff and Mary. She loved this area so much. Um, herself, her being a visionary and coming in and revitalizing, you know, parts, you know, with the agency, with the property that she bought, and again, with the agency building. Um, Today, you know, we have a clubhouse, we have rental property um, in the village, and we, I know as a team, are excited to see good things happen to the village. 
I understand working with the agency that, you know, these things, they take time. Uh, they take people that are brave enough to start with an idea and start a conversation. And then it's all about, you know, communication, collaboration, iterations. That's like our business. And I feel like that's what you guys are opening up to us as a community. And I'm really excited to be a part of it. I'm excited to hear everyone's ideas. And I think, um, Again, this is, was a wonderful presentation. There are different options, and I think if we're willing to work together, we can come you know, to something that's gonna benefit our businesses that we have, the people that live here today, and the potential for new people. I myself, again, love the area, but at night, you know, I'll go to Essex, I'll go to Chester, and I'd like to just stay home sometimes and maybe have something else to do. I do feel like I'm spending so much time there, I'm doing everything I can, but there's just something else, you know, that I'd love to see. And I'm, I don't have the answer for that, but I'm so grateful to be a part of this conversation. And everyone here at our agency is really excited that, again, these conversations are happening. So thank you, everyone that's here tonight. Mark Walter, 10 Deer Run again. I just wanted to add two more points. The um, whole parking dilemma has always been a challenge in East Haddam, but you have a giant state parking lot across the river. If you've ever been in the taxi uh, waterway system in Florida or Savannah, Georgia, the water taxis, the ferries, shuttle thousands of people across the water bodies every hour, all day long, all night long. So that, that's easily solved. And also, I was the chairman of the River Cog Council of Governments for our region. That's where your MPO and tip money is all determined, how we're going to spend federal and state dollars on infrastructure, highway renovations. You have Route 82 that needs to be reoriented for this project. You need federal and state money to help you do that. Your opportunity here is now but you can't get on the tip, you can't get on the MPO unless you have a real project. And the River Cog, I'm sure, would jump into this, help you get that dollars. There's a lot of American Rescue money coming down the pike. We're all trying to figure out how best to spend it, but now's the time to lock in those plans, not years later when this opportunity is gone. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify. I, I, I was not suggesting an anchor store. What I was doing was questioning your numbers because you say 97 million and we're only yet capturing 16. And I say, how are you going to do that unless you have the kind of businesses that can capture a greater share of the local spend? If your analysis was we're going to get money from other communities around and they'll be diving here spending it and you could support that, that's fine. But showing that there's bigger potential for spending but no way to capture it because none of those businesses you have there is going to capture it. That's, that was the question. Hi, I'm Erin Trawick. I bought my first house here about seven years ago, and we hope that it will be our only house as adults, or at least as long as we can think at the moment. Um, I travel professionally back and forth across the bridge many times per day. Uh, I would say, just as a thought point, that in the warm season, when um, you know when people are going to music on the river and when more people are going to Chester. I actually have a lot, of course the bridge is closed sometimes, but the biggest and most time consuming backup that I experience is coming off of exit seven on route nine, um, headed where, where there's no traffic light at the bottom of that on ramp by the Aisha Mart. Um, you can sit there for 45 minutes. So that would compound the issues that we would have in the future with, with the development. Um, so I don't know if you can work with Tylerville and the Haddam side of things to continue developing that section. Um, also just wanted to comment that I talk to a lot of people in work and in, in, in town who are part of the smaller contingent we used to have of uh, like New York residents and urban dwellers who had weekend homes, occasional warm season homes, gentlemen farms here. Um, 
and we used to be on the outskirts of what was acceptable for that sort of thing. But definitely it seems that with the, the pandemic market that we are no longer really on the outskirts for that sort of thing. And it seems to me like those people do only go out to eat in Essex and in Chester. They go to Old Saber just to go to the cheese shop and the fish store and spend a lot of money in those retail communities. And it seems that if people who bought houses in the next couple of pandemic market years, even if the market eventually changes, they're gonna be stuck with the, with the houses here. <laughs> so we might as well get our piece of that retail on some level and not get left behind as that affluence does influence what the core East Haddam community is. My name is Chris Reed, um, Hemlock Valley Road. I'd like to take just a little different view of this uh, project. Small town America today has a problem. Uh, this town has lost population. We've lost a third of our student population in the last 10 years. We're losing our tax revenues. We need more tax revenues. I support this project to support the people of East Haddam to keep our, tax, our taxes low, to grow our tax base. It has to be more than this project if we're gonna look 50 or 100 years down the road. I think this project sets us up for the next 30 years so that we can develop more things. Any small town, roughly two thirds of our budget goes to education. Education is very important. I'm not arguing the importance of it. But the fact is we have control over a very small portion or one third of our budget. If we're going to continue to stay this quaint little town, our taxes are going to continue to go up on all of us. I think that needs to be a view that we take of this. Everyone has to decide for themselves whether that's important to them, what it means to them when, uh, if, or when do they get axed out of a town like this. We are not alone in this problem. This is a problem a lot of small towns have. So this is a great way, I think, to bridge the next 30 years. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I actually want to uh, follow up on that gentleman's point. Um, is, is the project asking for a tax abatement from the town, Jeff? Um, all of the, all of the um, incentives that are a normal part of any development uh, are have yet to be even discussed in any kind of detail. Um, are you projecting tax abatements in your future? I, I, I'll say it again. Um, we're, we are going to be discussing a myriad of um, uh, okay, so, so, forgive me. So, so it does seem that the town should be prepared for you requesting tax abatements for the, po the possibility. There is a scenario where you are asking tax abatements. Um, tax abatement is one of the things that is um, a vehicle for develop, private developments um, and there are about three or four or five other things and Mike Goldman isn't here but that's one of them it's not necessarily the um, uh, option but it is a component of your project yes and the and the the whole um, discussion that, that will happen with the Board of Finance is what is the net positive to the town and that is the question that is the question that has to get answered and um, uh, um, as I've said numerous times now, um, this land doesn't get sold to us um, until all of those things have been um, settled and negotiated to where there is an advantage to the town for this project to go ahead. It just won't happen. And, and Rob, has anyone estimated the cost for infrastructure development at, at, uh, for this proposal? Infrastructure meaning? Talk to Rob, please. Rob? Uh, infrastructure is required to support this proposal. Is that correct? Well, there'll be some uh, potentially infrastructure. There are costs for the road alignment, uh, utilities underground, 
and those are outside the project would be a potential cost to the town. We'd be looking at uh, obviously grants and as I believe somebody else spoke up but there was uh, or mentioned there were some other options there but uh, potentially a TIF but uh, which the tax incentive fund but uh, you can uh, yes there will be cost to the town. I believe it's estimated five million dollars is that correct? Uh, there, there, there is a ballpark um, we're working, estimate. We're working in ballparks right yeah, now. but it's meaningless because we have no idea it's what not the. Mean, it's not meaningless. I'm sorry, um, Jeff, it's not it's meaningless, meaningless in the amount because um, the the extent to which uh, the road realignment, for instance, which is a state highway re project, um, the extent to which um, uh, burying the overhead utility lines, um, n nobody has any idea of what what those projects will actually cost. So there's, it's going to be in the millions of dollars. We know that. How many millions, it's hard to know. And, and the funding of those things is not, it's not intended that the town pay those things out of, out of you know, the, the, the funds in town. Agreed. Someone has to pay for them, though. And yeah. The taxpayer money, whether it comes from one pocket or another, it's still taxpayer money. I'm right. deeply concerned about the, the um, division between the aspirational components of your, your proposal, which are beautiful. A juice shop is great. But the reality is Dollar General stores and the incursion of stores like that throughout this part of Connecticut, actually throughout the country, and the, the uh, diminution of, of um, the, the um, uh, shopping experience. People are going to where things are inexpensive. People don't have a lot of money, especially post-COVID. And I wonder how you reconcile what your aspirational components are with, I think, the harder economic realities that we're all now facing. So, Mr. Silver, I'll let uh, Jeff answer, but your time is up. Thank you. Uh, John, do you want to say anything about that? I mean, I, I can say you, tell you that um, if this project gets reduced to a dollar general, Mary and I are out of it. We walk away. But there's a dollar general coming. No, in. John, you, you're not hearing me. We're not interested in doing a dollar general. If we can't make it work from a market study point of view, then it, it can't work. And then you do something else. But we're not we, a part we, of it. We've been through Banner Lodge. We've been through those bankruptcies. We've been through those multiple failures. And, and we don't want to line ourselves up for something where we're left with a beautiful project, but it's empty. Or maybe it's not serving the higher purpose that you're, that you're creating. That's, that, that's the whole reason we're not um, uh, closing on the sale of the property until we have our financing in place, which means all of our marketing research is done, until we have the plans uh, fully vetted through all the uh, approval agencies, until it's a project that we want and that the town, uh, the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance feel is, uh, is what they want, um, that doesn't, it, the sale doesn't happen. I, I wrote in the, in the handout, there's quite a, uh, a lengthy um, answer to uh, the Moody's debacle. Um, didn't get into, into all of the details, but um, there are stark differences between what this project is uh, setting out to do and what happened at Moody's Stark. Thank you. John, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I would like to say that um, this project is, is not just a retail project, and it doesn't have but 12 shops, including the restaurants, 12 spaces. So it's not an overwhelming amount of retail or restaurant and food offerings. It's actually fairly limited as a project goes. We've worked on major malls of millions of square feet and shopping centers and Dollar Generals and Dollar Trees and all of those. That is not what we're um, envisioning here. We're envisioning a place within the town. I mean, you can start at the north end of East Haddam and you can drive till you get all the way to the center of East Haddam and you can't find a place to buy a cup of coffee. It's just not there. Well, well, okay. But, in, but you get to the town and there's hardly anything here. Well, this would create a place, this would create a place 
where people can be enjoy time together and have offerings that are in a place that has a great feeling and it becomes a destination. Amalia, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deborah Mott, Hemlock Valley Road. Um, I'm a supporter of this project, and I think it's a wonderful first step. And there's clearly so much heart and thought that's gone into this, and I want to thank everybody who's been involved in that. Um, it is, from what I hear, a starting point, a step in the process. We're all involved in the conversation. But I do know that I, we moved here, how long ago? 2013, after about three years of trying to find a place to live, coming to a small town. I've been to five states, and I think I've been to every town in five states looking for a place to live. And it was the most depressing three years of my life because small town after small town that you would drive into that you could tell was once beautiful and was ruined. And it was ruined because people stopped having vision and they turned their back on that little village and it was desolated and people were going off and building malls and housing developments instead. You need to have vision. Maybe this isn't exactly how it will end up at the end of the day. Maybe it does get tweaked. Maybe it gets, maybe it's not as big. Who knows what steps need to happen from here on in. But I applaud having a vision of something that maintains New England, a New England village look, our small town shops, and a green. That's wonderful. It's such a contrast to what I experienced when I was looking. So again, a step in the process. Let's all get involved. Let's not, um, no one here, no one who has been involved in this is trying to harm this town. Clearly, they all love it. They're part of it. So let's take that, keep that in mind as we're having these conversations and share all of our ideas together. I'm sure we can get to someplace positive. That's it. Um, so while the plan will inevitably change, um, there's one part that will never change, and that's the public bathrooms. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we'll have the last two speakers, please, and then we're coming up right on 9.30. Okay. Um, Jeff Walter. I'm a lifelong East Haddam resident. Um, I'm probably one of the younger people who remembers old Modus and getting bologna from Abbey Pear, getting my hair cut by Joe Tesser, and um, I'm turning 60 this year, so, you know, it, one of the nice things that's come out of this because for the last 35 years, I've you know referred people who I met that just moved into town to Ken Simon's website to find you know the history of Old Moodus and kind of disappeared or I couldn't find it the last few years, so now it's back and that that's wonderful. I do think there's some you know I think it's a good lesson to maybe go back and look at that, but um, I think there's this is entirely different. Um, you know, I served on the zoning board. It's been a, about 15 years now. Um, and I know how this town approaches development. I've seen it, and we're not really good at it. All right, we're a little better today, but you know, you can look at Banner Lodge, which was mentioned. I think I saw that start as a development and get approved and get bankrupt or whatever three different times and um, there's other examples and I'm also a lawyer um, I've probably done three four five hundred tax you know TIF and other tax exempt bond deals in my life I've done you, you know these projects on a bigger scale every day and um, I'm kind of hearing my day job coming back to me tonight which um, and I've always liked they'll leave at the office because East Tatum just doesn't really have those kinds of issues. I'm also the chairman of the Goodspeed Board, and Goodspeed is not involved in this project. Goodspeed did not submit a proposal for this project, and I'm probably the person chiefly um, responsible for that. 
you know, at some of the town gown issues, at some of the reality of what good speed is. If this was 25 or 30 years ago, you know, good speed would probably have stepped up and solved the problem like when the Gelson House went bankrupt and the like. But that's not happening here. Good speed is perfectly, you know, situated. COVID's obviously a big impact, but we're gonna focus on producing musicals. But the idea of getting some type of development partner in the village would be a great thing for good speed and would allow good speed to unlock, you know, some of the resources that, you know, we just can't use or, or dedicate, in, you know, 100% at this point in time. This town needs to start somewhere, you know, with this kind of a project. I will tell you that the town, from a governmental infrastructure standpoint, we do not have a statutory redevelopment agency. Um, you know, the resources that we get involved, despite the, you know, the, the unbelievable efforts, and there's people, you know, and, and this goes way back 10, you know, it's probably 10, 11, 12 years now on the revitalization, com, you know, committee. You know, I, I brought some of my law partners down early on 10 or 11 years ago to kind of provide some expert, f you know, free advice about how to do some of these things. And we know where that ended up, ended up here tonight, you know, with, with the Rileys because you know, we, we, we sent out 90 proposals and got no responses. I know I took our proposals back to, to my office, which is one of the larger firms in the state, and we do as much of this as anybody. And I send those things out you know, for, in the interest of the town. To, to Time, please. Um, you know, we should be serious about this. If you want it to be a town park, get together, present that, do a referendum. I mean. You can do that in East Adam. If, but if we want to proceed with this, we should start with it and we should address all the issues because you know we're, we're just going to get bogged down in the issues and it's going to be kind of gotcha, you know, asking about TIFs, asking about tax abatements and all that. It should be done comprehensively. And you know what it looks like, and all that, that works itself out. I've done, you know hundreds of transactions and, and, and projects like this. They work out. There's always execution risk. Um, but Thank it's time you, Mr. for this town to step up and figure out how to address this project and maybe what the next one is. Uh, Dave Carbo. Uh, I like the architect's vision. Uh, one thing that uh, I like access to the river. Uh, one of the things I am concerned about is the uh, crosswalk. Right now, it's uh, during the busy time of the year. It is dangerous for people to cross that. So I don't know how you want to address that. Uh, one thing that comes to my mind is seasonal. Uh, good speed seasonal. The river is seasonal, seasonal, and so is the. Uh, a 16 train except for the winter ride. So um, what are the rents going to be for the uh, small shops and are they going to be able to weather the season, meaning the winter? That, that's my big, biggest concern. So uh, we've seen uh, a lot of slow business in the winter and, and whether they can make it through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garrish is going to read some of the communications that has come in uh, electronically at this point. We have four or five, which I'll read. Uh, this is from Laurel White. For the record, I am not in favor of this proposal. I want the town to own that property for town use for things like music on the river and farmers markets and the arts leagues, etc. This one is from Dot and Kaylee Millen. My daughter Kaylee Millen was the writer of the New York Times travel article about our town as one of the 50 best places. We spoke about the plan for the town and we concur that it has the effect of a carnival. It is an over the top, busy, scattered, architecturally annoying concept design that makes our town look more like a playland than a lovely New England town that it is. The plan is so dizzying, it reminds us of an arcade. 
The presence of our town's charm is lacking, attacked by an almost comical plan of development. Yes, we can modernize, but we do not need tasteless, unattractive apartments on top of buildings. Why is the land along the water to be utilized for a select few who can afford to reside there? Three stories for the wealthy. It is our, it is our treasured Connecticut River, a nature conserv conservancy last great place and should have an overlook, a place for all to visit, not just a select few. The current plan is very sad indeed. If we wish to bring more tourists about, we need to retain the feel, look, and heart of our town, not bring it down to junk, rinky-dink status. The proposed architecture is eclectic and distasteful. It is an atrocity. We are better than this. Why not enhance our small town look to that like our neighbor Chester or Woodstock, Vermont, towns that siren in visitors from all over due to charm, calm, yet modern quaintness. Time for another go at it. It must be redesigned. My name is William Riley. My wife is Dr. Susan Forcer. Our address is 2 Creamery Road. We wish to record our opposition to the proposed riverfront development just north of the swing bridge. It seems to us that it will unnecessarily add traffic to an already congested bridge in downtown add competition to existing businesses, some of which are already struggling, and convert what could be an attractive riverfront vista, such as a mini park, into an entirely un unnecessary additional mini shopping center. This is um, from Elizabeth Wardwell. Um, we do agree this development would be wonderful for more business and just for more of a downtown area for East Haddam. I think it would reflect positively for East Haddam and a more desirable place to live and not just viewed as a redneck town with a bunch of strange people. Thank you. Okay, and then this is the final one. Um, a little lengthy, but there are several questions here which I'll read. This is from Nancy Schroeder. I cannot attend the meeting person, but want to make my opinion and questions known to the board. I usually support change in many areas of life, but I have four major questions and concerns about this project. The scale of the artist rendering makes the square footage near the bridge seem much larger than it is, especially the wide exit area from the bridge and includes properties not owned by the town. It appears to be beautifully artistic, but not realistic. What would be the town's investment required to complete this plan, or would it be privately funded? What guarantees of timely and to plan completion would be given to the town by the developers? It should not be the speculative burden of the taxpayer. What research has been done regarding which shops and restaurants would commit to renting space here before the project goes ahead as described? Will the, those proposed shops and restaurants require incentives to carry them through the winter? People cite Chester as a destination that East Haddam could emulate, but even Chester does not have 40 restaurants and shops in its downtown area. Has a traffic and parking study for this plan been done for the projected increase of visitors? We are already expected to have traffic constrictions caused by the bridge repair. There is traffic backup on both sides of the river on normal days when the bridge is open. Has the state been consulted about handling traffic projections? Can we be informed by the condition that there is not enough parking for crowds at mis Music on the River events. Taxpayers have a right to know many more facts and details well in advance of any referendum. Nancy Schroeder. And that's it for uh, writings. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Mr. Riley, did you want to uh, touch on any of those or would you rather address them at a follow-up meeting? 
because we will be having another hearing, on, as I've said, uh, tentatively June 9th. Um, well, Mary and I have a lot to think about. We're not in this for any other reason that we want this to be a wonderful thing for the town that we live in. Um, uh, you know, if people hate the architecture, believe me, I've been at this for decades. We're one of the leading architectural firms in the country. Um, and even with that, um, I've had many people hate the buildings that I've designed. Many people love them. Um, so we can take that. But if, um, if people want this to be a public park, pony up, make it a public park, um, and uh, would be delighted. Uh, we're not pushing this thing for any reason other than we want East Haddam to be um, something more than, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five abandoned buildings right in the heart of uh, its quote unquote crown jewel. Five abandoned buildings. Abandoned, not, not out of business, abandoned. Nobody there. So it's time to get the wrecking ball out, tear them down, and do something nice in that spot. So. Okay, folks, I want to thank everyone for participating this evening. Uh, I think this has been very helpful to uh, all involved and especially the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance and the uh, Village Revitalization. And I'm sure uh, Center Bridge Group will uh, take your comments into consideration and di for further discussion. Again, we will have a second hearing on June 9th, and that's a tentative date. We have to confirm this room is available. And uh, we'll be uh, accepting additional comments at that time and uh, again hopefully we can have a continued uh, participation at this amount of people thank you all have a good night